So we'll get through as many as possible. All right, Stada Hosai. How, um, how, how the sister is asking how to advise, uh, she says, how to advise my sister who doesn't dress modestly and I want to see her and do well for her akhira. I want to see well, like, you know, you just want good for your sister. How can she advise her? I always have so many follow-up questions when we get these, like, is this your real sister? Are you close to her? Um, is it your friend? And a lot of those variables matter because... Adina Nasiha, and we have to be very delicate when we're advising people. Um, so the closeness of the bond really does matter. Um, and I would just say, continue to be a good sister to your sister. When we reflect all the virtues that we've talked about, and we are loving and kind and supporting, you're definitely going to get more reception. And, and if that opportunity, so um, yeah, the the better, the more you focus on just being a really good um, model, modeling the virtues of our faith, then inshallah, when the opportunity, if the opportunity presents itself to, for you to give advice, she will likely receive it better. But if every time you meet with her, you're just focusing on her not wearing hijab, and in your heart, you're kind of judging her, um, even if it's coming from a place of wanting her guidance, then you may lose that uh, opportunity to really create a bond. Um, alhamdulillah, you know, I, I have relatives who do not wear the hijab. And to be honest, it be, it's become something that I don't really focus on uh, when I'm with them. I just want to enjoy my time with them and and create that bond and I feel that over the years we have definitely built a very strong bond and there have been times where yes conversations go into different directions and I find that they genuinely are listening uh, and they want to hear what I have to say because they haven't felt judged by me the entire time that we've been friends with or I mean that I've been close to them so I would just say continue to be a good sister make and then also the other part of it make a lot of dua your dua in, uh, the abs in her absence uh, could be the very reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns her heart to wear the hijab and just uh, continue to just be a good sister, inshallah. Hijab is definitely fard, but um, it's not something that we should make as a, or prevent us from feeling close to someone who doesn't wear a hijab because everybody's on their own path, inshallah. Uh, this question has to do with the probably just like the the rule following. Sometimes um, people get uh, have questions about that. So, how important is it to pray towards the qibla, and is it important to do will do with water all the time? It, it's a valid question, so we'll answer it. Definitely, absolutely. Um, so, is it? Let, let me tell you something. In fiqh, and it's not a fiqh class today, but we're going to go into fiqh or Islamic rulings for a moment. Across all the schools, the rule is that you have to determine the location or the direction of the qibla in order for your, val your prayer to be valid. Interestingly, it means that you exert your best effort. So, dear sisters, these phones that you carry, they have a built-in compass. Yeah? And in your prayer app, it also has a compass. And I am old enough <laughs> to have carried compasses, actual compasses, with me forever, everywhere I went, in school, college, you know, <laughs> whatever, everywhere, everywhere we went, everywhere we went, right, before these smartphones happened and then we became kind of dumb and we forgot how to, like, figure out the direction of the Qibla, subhanAllah, they're right here. These compass apps, or whether an actual compass, or even better, is learning <laughs> the shadows, which is how people before compasses used to figure out the directions of the qibla and also the timings of prayer. They'd figure out north, east, west, and south. One time, I'll tell you this very quick story. One time I came, I was in an international travel and the, the, my transit was very, very short. And when you're in an airport and you have to like run from one gate to another really quickly, and I had to catch prayer right in that little tiny window <laughs> or prayer would have left. 
And when you come out of an airport and you're like discombobulated, it's international, you don't know where you are, it's not, <laughs> you can't, you can't even speak what the language is, what's going on, you, you, you're, it's kind of discombobulating. And I thought to myself, okay, I, at the very least, I'll look out and see like the shadows. Well, it turned out that by then it was very uh, cloudy and I couldn't figure out the direction of anything, where the sun was. So I said, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, please help Ya Allah. The interesting thing is in about an airport is that people, especially in an airport, know the directions. <laughs> You know which way is east, north, and south. And I said, what is the direction of east? Help me. Just give me one. Just give me east. Do something. You know? And so, subhanAllah, as I came out of the airport, and the, the person who answered my question said, are you looking for the qibla? And I thought, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was a Muslim brother. I couldn't tell, subhanAllah. But he could see I was frazzled trying to figure out the direction of prayer. Or at least a direction. And I thought, Allah sends you people, subhanAllah. With a good intention, Try your very hardest. And I'll tell you a follow-up story. <laughs> One time, two of us who had taken a fifth class together were in another conference, and we had to pray. And we had nothing with us to figure out exactly the direction. Inside of a building, it's all like close, and, and it was actually nighttime. It was a night prayer, so there was no sun to exactly see where it set it, where it, you know where it came up, and where it set. And so anyway, the rule in the fifth book is you have to do your best effort to figure out the direction of the qibla. And if the two of you disagree, each one has to pray according to the qibla that they figure it out is the best. And so I tried to convince her it's this way. And she tried to convince me it's this way. And we couldn't <laughs> agree. We had both studied fiqh. We were both students of fiqh. And at the end, we both said, we know what the rule is. And each one prayed on our own. And it and it counted for each person because they did the prerequisite. So I always tell people, don't walk into a room, just go, um, Allah Akbar. <laughs> you got to give some effort, some effort of figuring out east, north, west, and south. Now, in terms of wudu, the answer is the same. It requires a full wudu always, right? And with the few, or I should say, with the few exceptions, but they have to qualify for the exceptions that require a dry ablution or tayammum. And if it does not qualify for tayammum, then a full water wudu is actually required if your wudu was broken. But if you're one of the lucky people that know how to carry a wudu from one prayer to another, some people are a ken, they don't like break wudu easily, you'll carry wudu for a little while. Otherwise, it is hard. And nowadays, in the university where I work, there's a lot of same gender, like one gender bathrooms, right? Listen, the rooms, the, ba the bathrooms, I mean, that have the one person stalls, and they say, for everybody, all genders. I'm like, fine. Because at least it closes the door and I'm able to use this. I use this in airports, I use this in bathrooms, in schools, colleges, everywhere, wherever I am. If I can find that, it's easy because you can close the door and easily make wudu. Right? And if not, then it's hard. Yes, it's hard, but it is part and parcel of being Muslim. Uh, for Shada Maryam, um, how does one start or work on surrendering to the law and just letting go? I think it really depends on the circumstance. This is super general, and it really, really could depend on what the person is asking about. Um, sometimes people ask me this when they have a specific du'a that they've been making for a very long time, and they're wondering if the fact that it's not being answered means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just doesn't want to give it to you for whatever reason. Maybe it's not good for you. Maybe it's not good for your akhirah. Um, and so this is where they're asking that question from. I'm going to answer it from that perspective because there's no other context, and that's the the one I'm asked most. Um, but number one, recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you so much that he always decrees what is best for you, even if in that moment it doesn't feel like it's the best thing. And I'll give you the example of somebody who, um, you know, wants to get married. I get this question all the time. Wants to get married, wants to get married. It's been like 10 years they've been making dua. It's been 15 years they've been looking, and they're just looking and looking, and now they're wondering, should they just give up? Should they just stop? Now they're in their mid-30s. They've been looking since they were like 20, um, and they're wondering whether or not Allah has willed marriage for them. And whenever someone asks me this question, I always ask them, do they want to get married? Is this something they want? 
And if the answer is yes, they actually want it. It's not something that they feel pressured into. It's not something that their parents are, you know, begging for them to do. It's something they've been open to and they've really sincerely been trying. Then I suggest that they keep asking and they keep making istikhara about, other, you know, any opportunities or anything that might open because you never know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for you. You will never lose with du'a. So if it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed that marriage is not the best for this person, then maybe he's going to open a different door. But while you're making du'a for marriage, you say, if it's best for me, open this door. If it's best for me, facilitate it. If it's best for me, give me better than I can ask for. And in the process, if it's not best for you, then Allah will give you something better. He absolutely will. You literally cannot lose with du'a. Either he will avert some evil from your life, may Allah protect everybody and everyone everyone we love, Ya Rabb, or he will give it in the hereafter, or he will give something better than you can imagine while you're making that dua, or he will delay it for a better time, he will give something different. You can't lose with dua. So the first thing is just keep making the dua with the clause, if it's best for me. If it's not, then take it away from me and bring me something better. And the secondly, after that, what actions are you taking or not taking? I know I'm giving the marriage example, so I'm sorry if your question was about something totally unrelated. Um, but a lot of people I know are only open to marrying someone of their specific race or of their specific state. They don't want to move out of state. Um, they have to marry someone who has the same type of career background or a specific type of income level. Um, those are fine. It's fine to have those general you know, interests, but that's going to close the opportunities for a person who's looking. So what do what does the person looking and at making dua for also need to do to open kind of like those doors? Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending someone over and over and because of specific requirements that they're just closing that door over and over themselves. So constantly make istikhara, keep your you know your your options open um, and always you know make dua but also in the process Please, you know, I'm really big on this. I always talk about Maristan to everyone and their mom. Please go to therapy, you know, it, uh, contact Maristan. Sometimes the reasons why people are saying no to individuals is actually not because of the other person, but because of something they need to work through. So going through therapy and navigating that is really important so that inshallah you are at a place where you can sincerely consider who might actually be good for you. So maybe it hasn't happened yet because you're not at the right space yet. Only Allah knows. I don't know. I'm told, I have no, no idea. Um, and maybe it's not meant. It's not meant for every person. And that is why we have so many examples in our history of women and men who did not marry, but who were scholars, who were du'ats, who were so involved in Islam. They could travel. They could do so much more because they didn't have the responsibility of family and in this particular way. So only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And may Allah bless every single one of you and everyone that you love with the best. Ya Rabbul Um Another one for Sadhana Mariam about... Um, Book recommendations, mashallah, your talk was like packed with so many interesting uh, people and figures and history. So uh, several questions actually about, you know, your reading list maybe for the recommendations. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone else if they have recommendations. I have, I generally read in Arabic only now because the sources in English are so limited. There are more and more that are coming, um, but I know a last time I said I'm done with my book. I was not done. I thought I was done, but now I'm still working on it. Inshallah, when it's out, inshallah, it'll be a resource. Inshallah, please make to offer it. It's taking forever. Um, but uh, in the book, I've translated so much because so much is just not in English. However, what I do know in English that I really recommend is Al Muhaddithat, and I say this every all the time A L M U H A D D I T H A T, Al Muhaddithat. It's by Sheikh Akram Nadawi, and it's in English. Um, and then there's also Tahrir al Mar'a, is just being translated by Adil Salahi, and I don't know it's what it's called in English. What is it called in English? Uh, women's Social Participation, or something like that. But look up A D I L. S-A-L-H-I, Adil Salahi. It's a six-volume book in Arabic, and he's translating different volumes slowly. Um, and then there's also Reclaiming the Mosque, Reclaiming the Mosque by Dr. Jasser Auda, huge scholar of Maqasid in our time, um, Reclaiming the Mosque. Um, and then there's one more in English, which is, help me, what's another one in English? Mm, there's one. Uh, just like a Women's Issues, Women's Scholarship, Women's Scholars of the Past. I know there's one more that I'm missing. It's like a biography or bibliography. Not bibliography, it's a biography. Um, sorry. If I think of it all, I'm so sorry that it's 
Yeah, inshallah, inshallah, all of you will be those who contribute to the literature that we desperately need in English, but it's, 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 it's getting out there just slowly. But there's definitely more that I just don't know off the top of my head. Okay, I was just thinking we, we need a book list. <clears throat> uh, Forrest Ada Hosai. Um, I've been wearing hijab on and off for a couple of months. I'm at the point where I don't know how to answer people who see hijab as black and white. How will I know when I'm ready to commit to hijab? How long is the correct amount of time to take to make the decision of starting your hijab journey? Um, this is a tough question because what I really want to say is <laughs> don't answer them. I mean, you know, I feel like people just need to respect boundaries. It's odd. Like you couldn't imagine someone going up to someone who, you know, with their prayer and asking them, when are you going to do all five of your prayers? Like just the idea of someone doing that is just very intrusive and um, I don't know, I, I find it uh, just... Um, yeah, intrusive. But I think it depends on the person. And I, I would say to the sister, this is your journey with hijab. It's very private. It's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You shouldn't feel pressured to uh, rush your decision because people are putting these, you know, questions before you and now you feel like you have to answer to them. No, you don't. It's your, it's yours. Own it, claim it. And you can respectfully just say, I'm, I'm just in a transition in my life and you know, it might take me more time, but, you know, you'll know when I start wearing it all the time. But, again, these are the types of questions that it really depends on the relationship you have with the one who's asking you. Um, but if you can and if you feel comfortable, I'm, I'm a big fan of being in control of your own narrative. So I am an open communicator, and if I felt like this was me, I would likely announce to my siblings, for example, or my, you know, the people in my close immediate circle, like, listen, I'm you know, going to be, you know, wearing hijab maybe here and there. And it's a very personal thing for me. And I would love your support and dua. And I would include them in that way. If you're comfortable, that could be an option. That way they they feel like they're partly with you. Um, but I do feel sometimes people, especially around hijab, if they don't wear hijab, they might feel uncomfortable because they don't know if you are going to continue to change and they are not, you know, in, on the same path as you. So they sometimes, I think, people may put their own comfort before your comfort. And that's why you have to kind of s assess the situation. What is the motive of the questioner? Are they really curious about your path? Or is it more that you're making them uncomfortable and they're just kind of putting you on the spot? Um, you know, we don't want to necessarily have uh, su'adhan or think the wor uh, worst of people. But I would just say that when questions are posed like this, it's difficult because there's so many follow-up uh, details that I think would make it easier to answer. But generally speaking, hijab is very personal, and I think we have to, as women, um, own that it is a personal decision and somehow, in the most graceful way, let our loved ones know that it's it'll take time. And I encourage you to continue on your path Inshallah, and if it takes you months, uh, alhamdulillah. If it takes you years, alhamdulillah. But if you want to, you know, really kind of have a solid plan, I would say, and I, I have advised sisters, and it's worked, set a deadline for yourself. You don't have to share that with everybody. But you could just say, I'm going to give myself two months, three months, or, you know, by this point, maybe it's a personal uh, milestone for you, a, year, a time in your life where you feel like you really want to, by that point, um, commit to the hijab. And that's your personal deadline. You don't need to broadcast that to anybody. Because as soon as you do it, and, or if it, that time comes and then you're not ready, everybody's going to come and start judging you again. So I just feel like we have to kind of be very careful with oversharing. But if it's, again, a relationship where you feel comfortable, then just let them know that you're on a journey. And just like all journeys, it takes time. So, alhamdulillah. Dr. Rania, how does one become an Islamic psychologist? Really? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Happy, happy to talk about it. Alhamdulillah. First of all, there's the Maristan booth out there, and you can talk to them, mashallah. Um, it's actually outside in the foyer, and you're welcome to, to chat with the folks at the table. Um, yeah, so how do you do this? So I always talk about how if you're going to put the word Islam before anything, so in this case, Islamic 
psychology, then it has to be something that's actually starts with and is grounded in Islam. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of discussions on, you know, you know, let's kind of throw in a little bit of hadith here and a little bit of Quran here and make mental health kind of Muslim. And there is a field actually called Muslim mental health, which is for Muslim people, right, and kind of their mental health. But it's not the same as Islamic psychology. What Islamic psychology means is that the foundation of the actual field starts with Islam and then a psychology is derived or built upon it from Islam itself if that makes sense. So how does one go around, go about doing this? Um, it re does require, and in fact, my, um, every week in Maristan, I, I teach the, the therapist, I, I go through the book, the book that we, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, were able to finish and complete is called um, Introducing Islamic Concepts in Clinical Mental Health Care. And what that's about is basically talking about exactly what I mean. Here are the foundations of Islam and how do you integrate them into clinical care. So in that training that we're doing, it identifies and says, how do you become an Islamic psychologist? And it, has, it gives you three main things. It says, first, you have to be able to ground yourself in Islam, which means a lifelong journey of Islamic learning. None of us, nobody here, nobody on this panel, alhamdulillah, and none of you either, inshallah, start studying Islam and say, okay, now I'm done. The minute you say you're done is actually the minute you know everything is lost, <laughs> subhanAllah. You've got to keep going and keep going in your studies, even if it's adding little by little. So it's a commitment to what? To a lifelong journey of Islamic learning. Secondly, in this country, in America, you cannot become a psychologist, a therapist, a psychiatrist, a counselor of any sort unless you are certified and credentialed by an actual program. So that's either a master's degree or a PhD degree, or in the case of a psychiatrist, an MD, a medical degree. And you need those certifications to be able to practice in this country. So, alhamdulillah, I hope, <laughs> we are having less people going around the community saying, I can be a counselor, I can counsel you. Alhamdulillah, they can give you nasiha, they can give you religious counseling or maybe some coaching, but they're not actual therapists or clinicians unless they've actually done their degrees, certifications, licensing, and exams. Right? They are, they are board exams and they're boards that govern this practice for ethical behavior and correct practice. And thirdly, the place in which you're neither sheikh nor are you, you're not a sheikh here and you're not a complete secular therapist or psychologist is that middle space of how do you bring Islam into the story and that's actually learning the ways, so it's basically the training that I was talking about. We call it the Traditionally Integrated Islamic Psychotherapy or TIIP model for those interested um, or taking some sort of diploma or course in Islamic psychology so that you can bridge your Western secular psychology training and bridge that to the Islamic training and actually learn the concepts. So there's three steps of how you become an Islamic psychologist. Um, there's a few questions about um, study advice. Um, like, where's a good place to study? People that want to memorize uh, Quran, people that want to just learn their fardain, um, make sure that they're grounded, uh, just maybe recommendations from the panel. Obviously, the Rahma Foundation, um, but also Rabata, uh, mashallah, amazing institute. Everyone knows Dr. Tamara Gray and the work that she's doing with centering women's voices in Islamic history and what that means now. It's online, it's accessible. So between Rahma and Rabata, mashallah, we have resources we never had in the past. Also, As Salam Institute is Dr. Akram Nadawi's online institute. And if you'd like to do a higher level, um, like a series that have to do with uh, other texts that he specifically has teaches, you can also study with him. I didn't mean to say higher level, as in Robolta doesn't have higher level. They both have higher level. They're just different types of tracks. I know Dr. We wanted Dr. Haifa to be here today, but she wasn't able to join us because of her schedule. Uh, so I will say uh, Jenna Institute. And now that you've taken all the woman ones, <laughs> which is great, they're usually the ones I give first on the list, alhamdulillah, that came. Um, other places that, and I always tell people who ask me, especially uh, high school students, college age students, or anybody who is in a stage of life where they can actually take what we call a gap year, I really encourage people to take a gap year in their studies, because at the end of the day, whether you graduate at 21 or 22, no one's going to remember. Or if you go finish your graduate degrees at 24 or 25, no one's going to remember. But that one year that you spent studying Islam, right, and I'll give you some of the names of the seminaries in just a moment here, is going to make a massive difference in your life. So I really encourage people to literally pause for a bit and take a gap year if they can. 
inshallah. And if you can't, then do the programs we're talking about here. At Abata, you take one course at a time, one course at a time, like a semester, right? You can, every woman in this room can literally add a Rabata course in their year. Every woman can do that. Also, Jannah Institute does something called the Year of Knowledge, so you dedicate a year to learning the foundations of your deen. The other seminaries that are both online and in person is the Qalam Institute, which is based out of Texas. And that is, can take you from step one, literally, literally, alif, ba, ta, literally, literally letters, alif, ba, ta, to full on five year alim, alima program. I was visiting them in Texas just a few months back, and I went into the beginner class. They said, this is year one. They said they started in, so I was visiting in November. They started in September with the academic year. They said, these students here only knew Alif Ba'ta when they came, and they could only recognize the alphabet. And I said, what? Because I'm standing in the back of the class, and they are literally legit reading text. <laughs> and I'm like, how in three months did you get people going from Alif Ba'ta to reading? It's amazing, right? But that's what happens when you dedicate to like a strong, good program. So I encourage you to look out for Qalam and do a virtual or you can do it in person in Texas. And then you can also, if you have a year, go to Taysir Seminary that's in Tennessee. Ustada Zainab Ansari, who's one of our dear teachers and beloved friend of ours, is the resident scholar of the Taysir Seminary. So a woman, mashallah, a resident scholar. And it's a year long program in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I'll add those two to the list as well. Taysir Seminary. You've said them all. <laughs> like, no, she wants to spell it. I can't think of any others. Those are all the ones I was going to say. As well? Yeah. Oh, we forgot Zaytuna, of course, of course. <laughs> which, which is in our neighborhood. Yes. Mashallah. If you're hoping to do a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, of course, here in Berkeley, uh, it has to be in person at Zaytuna College. Um, Taysir is spelled T-A-Y-S-E-E-R. Taysir Seminary. Mm -hmm. That's in person in Knoxville. Qalam is the one that has both. And another one, if you want to send your kids uh, in person, is Miftah. I think a lot of you have heard about Miftah. They were in this masjid before, and they're in Michigan. And they have a full-on boys program and now a girls program as well. But they're um, in-person uh, program. Um, Did we forget something? Yeah, the earlier ones we said. Yeah, the earlier ones, yeah. Rabata. Yeah, Rabata Jada Institute, uh, Friday Night at Rahma. Come Welcome. here, Friday <laughs> <laughs> um, night. This one, is, I think, speaks to our time. If a Muslim man who is not responsible, hasn't been a provider, doesn't take a leadership role in making the kids religious or anything else in the household, but is otherwise a good man, is that man still superior to his wife? And does the hadith about his woman not being grateful to him still apply? And that's first other Maryam. <laughs> so there's a difference between fiqh and relationship advice therapy. Fiqh is law. It's dry. It doesn't look at what are the dynamics of this. If you say this and he responds in this way, also actually it does mention some of those things for some rulings. But it's not going to say, um, respond to him in this way and then his heart will become soft, and then your heart will become soft, and then you're going to fall in love more. And Fiqh doesn't deal with any of that. It's law. So from a dry legal perspective, if a husband is not financially providing fully for his wife, it does impact Fiqh. It absolutely impacts the rulings of the rights that he receives. But I'd like to go back to the end of the question, which was something like, does that mean he's superior to his wife? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make the husband or the wife superior to one another in his sight. Both of you are equal in his sight. There is a level of responsibility that the husband has over the family and over the wife and the, um, and the, the questioning that he will be asked as a shepherd or as the leader of the family um, and, the, and the way that he makes uh, decisions that will impact the whole family with the support and the guidance and the um, and the discussion of his wife and his children and the family. Now, there are going to be men and women who are abusive, who abuse their trust, who abuse their roles and their rights, including two children. And there is a legal system in place for when that takes place. But if we're not talking about abuse, we're just talking about he's a good man, which is what was mentioned, but he doesn't take care of financially providing. He's not um, you know, in the role of a, of a spiritual leader, which is, I think, what the question was alluding to. Then and really, in today, if, you, if you're asking this question and you're not, you're in California and you can't go to an Islamic court system and you're asking what to do, there's two things I would recommend. One, go to therapy. If you cannot go to therapy with your husband because he doesn't want to go or he refuses to go, go on your own. 
um, it's very important that you go and you seek what you can do differently or what you just need to hear if for yourself and how that may or may not change the dynamic. So you going to speak to a professional is really key. That's much more important than you hearing, asking and me, me who is not a professional in um, anything related to clinical science or relationships or marriage therapy, any of those things, answering this question on how that's going to impact your relationship. Please speak with a professional. That's the first thing. The second thing is this is a very general Q&A. Your specific situation should also be discussed with a person of knowledge. If there's an imam or a sheikha that you trust, Dr. Rania herself, go to them and speak and ask about the specifics of your dynamic and seek advice because it sounds like you're saying he's a good man. That's not someone who you're afraid of. It's just maybe he's not giving you all of the rights Islamically. And the third is looking at the rules of fiqh. So one, if he is not fully financially providing for you and you are contributing to the household, there's a few things that happen. One, scholars discuss that he no longer has the right to certain rights that he receives due to, due to giving that provision. But again, when I say scholars say, I'm not going into all of the details. Scholars say is a huge statement. Which scholar? Which madhab? How does the madhab look at that issue? This is not the place for that longer discussion. I'm just giving you generalities that there are scholars who discuss whether or not the provision happens, how that impacts his rights. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you decide that you are going to contribute to the household, yes, it is sadaq from you because you are not required to do it so it's sadaqah from you but some scholars also say that he cannot accept it as sadaqah and it has to be a debt that he has to pay you back and so in that case you would need to write a contract that at some point he would need to repay you if that is what you're asking for so these are just interesting ways that Islamic law looks at this issue I'm not I'm sorry this isn't the place for like a long fiqh discussion on it I guess the, the, the minor point is you have rights and Islam recognizes your rights. Two, the mentality that he is somehow above you is, is unfortunately something that is absolutely seeped throughout Muslim, you know, many Muslim thought uh, mindsets. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the honor and responsibility on both individuals in a marriage. The issue of who is going to make the final decision with certain aspects or who holds the more who holds more weight in terms of responsibility um, is one that, of, of course, is a discussion within um, Islamic law, but also that falls on are they fulfilling their rights, the rights and the responsibilities that they have in a household. And finally, please make sure that you speak with professionals. And I actually should have passed this question before even answering it to everybody else. So. I, like, I feel, Let me fix I feel like, no, did. I feel like you did such an amazing job. Literally, was, what I was going to add was not exactly professional because it's like that's the first step but the but I just want to add one more thing it was actually related to dua which is something we talked about earlier in the questions but I just want to tell the sister who asked this and any sisters who have a similar question or something else that they're dealing with similarly please don't underestimate the power of dua remember that people are what you when you see them right now or in the years that you've known them these are also stages or seasons of life and people do have the propensity to change Allah is so gracious to us, he allows for tawbah, <laughs> repentance, and coming, coming back all the time. And so we, we hope that the person you're asking about is somebody who sees the light at some point, right, and is able to actually change. And the reason why we would tell a sister to really, if a person, if a man is good to her, a husband is good to her in every other way, of not just sort of walking away from it, it's because if he has the propensity potentially to change, this could be a very powerful and wonderful marriage, potentially even though right now in this season, it's very difficult. And so the reason I say that is because we have counseled women, subhanAllah. And I sometimes share this, some of you have heard these stories before, where year after year, we see them in women's conferences and they have very difficult things happening at home. But how many times have I had a woman, subhanAllah, who I've met year after year after year with very difficult circumstances, and I would say, dua. Don't underestimate dua. Make sure you're taking all the steps, the counseling and all the steps we talked about, but don't underestimate the power of dua. And how beautiful is it? And this has truly happened. Like it's a real thing that I've experienced in a women's conference like this, where after several years, subhanAllah, she came and said, my husband is here. Here he is. Alhamdulillah. He's turned a corner. He's turned a new leaf in a new chapter in his life. Something happened, and subhanAllah, sometimes there are hard things or bad, bad things. Nothing's ever bad with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sends us sometimes heavy things to wake us up, right? But they woke him up out of the stupor he was in, subhanAllah, and he turned a leaf. And I think that's really important, subhanAllah. So just just give some hope and advice that our teachers give us, alhamdulillah. Uh, 
you know, many of the women who mentioned studying overseas um, get, you know, but there being more barriers to travel and studying now, even in the countries that were named Syria and, and even Yemen, uh, a difficulty to go there now because of the situation. But in the Bay, mashallah, where there's so many different programs, there's still uh, uh, the issue of access. Like, not everybody knows about the classes. Not everybody is able to come here. So uh, what can we do to sort of connect? Um, they mentioned the inner city youth, uh, children that are coming, girls that are coming from uh, immigrant families who don't necessarily have transportation or uh, just their locality doesn't have classes. I can just, we're, we're trying to branch out. So what we're doing currently is uh, we're working with a group of uh, sisters who are being mentored as part of our Friday night program. The pre-class, our teachers do take a class. Uh, right now they're taking with, with Dr. Rania for, to mentor their teaching. And then um, they're running their own halakha um, in Oakland. So we, we do have that on the radar. It's something that we've done in the past um, in different communities and we want to expand because we, we know that access is difficult in terms of um, you know, families coming to Pleasanton, especially on a Friday night. We all know the traffic, it's just traffic situation and such. So it's just definitely something on our radar. I want to just uh, answer that question. Oh, where, did, where did Suzanne go? Did she run? We got to get her back. Um, there are some questions related to uh, what about nail polish? Do, um, uh, other of uh, like fad, like uh, fit questions, and I, I would just say. Those type of questions really need a course of study because there's a lot of what ifs to your ibadah, and the best thing, the best advice, is just to complete a program so that when you stand in your prayer, you don't have to deal with doubt, and then you focus on the being mindful in that ibadah. So um, I would say that, and then. What I'm